Welcome back to a special episode of Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom. I'm Brendan Davis, your host, and I had some pretty big podcast news this week, at least in my world. A lot of things happened. My friend Mike Shaw released his very first episode of his cool new show, Migratory Patterns. Of course, I'm biased, but I think he did a really great job, and it's an interesting show. So please check that out and subscribe, etc. Links to that are in the show notes. Now, this recording is of the podcasting event last night that I got to be part of called Podcasting in the Jing, a panel discussion, and it was a a lot of fun. There were hosts from three other shows on stage with me, as well as about 15 or so hosts of other shows in the audience. So it was a very kind of inside baseball night, but it was a lot of fun. And I think it's useful to anyone who's curious about how we make the podcast donuts in general, not just in China. So please check it out if you're into podcasting beyond just occasionally casually listening. I think you'll find it interesting. Now, after the formal program was over, we, there was a Q&A, and I kind of introduced Mike, and we officially launched Migration Media last night. And Migration Media is discussing discussed more in the episode right before this in my queue. Um, this event here tonight is presented in its entirety, and um, I, there were some pauses and whatnot, you know, a few things during the event where a mic battery was a little low. I actually did not edit very much. I did a lot of mastering, EQing, and compressing to make it sound as good as possible. The recording was pretty good, too. But if um, you find that those little dead spots, the dead air occasionally bothers you, which there's not much of it. I'm probably overselling it. But I have recently been converted to Overcast, the Overcast podcast app, and I have no no reason to endorse them. I'm not getting, certainly not of the size where they would pay me to promote it, but I kind of love it. So um, try Overcast to take out the dead spots if that bothers you. Now, a few more quick notes before we kind of rock into this. One thing is that I am finishing my Udemy course on podcasting sometime during this next week of time. This TV gig that I got that you might have heard about if you follow me on social media. If you don't, I was fortunate. My company, I was able to get a gig directing a TV documentary, but the way these things work is they kind of come in and they take over your life. And so it was really great, but the timing meant that I've had to adjust in several different places. So for one thing, besides pushing my Udemy course completion, the release date for that ebook I've been working on is going to have to push as well. Basically this TV project owns my life until about mid October. So maybe I'll take some good advice. I got way back when I first thought of this, and that is to aim for a Christmas release instead for the book. So the Udemy course, the complete podcasting course is going to be out and I'm going to finish, as I said, sometime this next week as I'm getting into the edit for the TV thing proper. Lastly, for now, I have decided to shelve this show's Patreon page. It was a noble experiment, but sometimes those are meant to end gracefully and I really can't devote the time to feeding it that I'd you know, that it would take to make it a really special addition to the show. But in some related news, the new migration media platform will at some point be launching a Patreon page of its very own that has a little bit more of a nonprofit angle. Mine was pretty nonprofit too, frankly, but this will be intentional. So that's going to be worth checking out when it's live. And also, I just want to say happy Independence Day to all my friends and family back in the U.S. and, you know, living in another country. I would like, you know, several people ask me, oh, did you do anything? I actually was working. I didn't do anything special. But there were certainly celebrations. There were a lot of people wishing each other well. And so just so you know, the spirit of what our country used to be is alive and well here in this foreign country that I find myself uh, living in now. So, all right. Speaking of checking out live things, let's please enjoy this live recording from the Podcasting in the Jing event. Welcome to Podcasting in the Jing, a panel discussion with Beijing-based hosts and producers. I'm Kate Logan, I'm here on behalf of the Environment China podcast, um, who has organized tonight's event. And basically, what we're trying to do is get together. There's been incredible growth in the number of Beijing-based podcasts in the last couple of years, and actually um, was looking at the panelists here tonight and realized that Environment China, having started only a year and a half ago, is actually the oldest uh, podcast here, and the other three are all just about one year old. Um, so tonight we have representatives of four different Beijing-based podcasts. Um, so to my left here, we have Noah Lerner, um, who's one of the other uh, co-hosts and co-founders of Environment China, um, which focuses on a range of environmental issues and the people who are working in the environmental field in China. Um, we have uh, Yajun Zhang um, of the Woman podcast, um, who co-hosts and co-founded the podcast along with Jing Jing Zhang. Um, we also have John Arterman of China Tech Talk, uh, which is part of TechNode. Um, and then lastly, we have Brendan Davis of the Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom podcast. 
Um, and before I start, I also want to add a couple of notes. Um, first of all, a huge thank you to Naked Hub, our venue for tonight's event. Um, they asked very kindly that if you go out on the balcony, please do not smoke. Um, but other than that, uh, the only other thing to take note of is that all the drinks are free, as I mentioned before, so please go ahead and help yourself. Uh, on another note, we are also live recording tonight's event with plans of turning it into a podcast of its own. Um, so if you have friends or others who are interested in podcasting, thinking about starting their own podcast or just learning more about some of the shows that we have here together tonight, um, they can look forward, hopefully, to a published episode out of tonight's event. Um, so as a little bit of background, basically today we're going meta as we bring together an all-start lineup of podcasts that all started right here in Beijing to talk about podcasting. Um, and I mentioned the guests already, um, and I think, uh, let's see, apart from that, basically the way we'll structure it is uh, we'll do about 45 minutes of Q&A first, um, and then we'll open it up to um, the floor for questions from the audience for the final 30 minutes or so. Um, so with that, I think it's best to let the people who are usually the ones asking the questions do most of the talking tonight. Um, so we're going to start just by having each guest briefly introduce yourself, maybe take aim for about two minutes, uh, and talk about your podcast and the mission goal of your podcast. So we'll start with, um, let's start with uh, Noah. Maybe you can just build on Environment China as the, the host tonight. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Kate, for organizing tonight's event. Really cool to, I don't think I knew there were so many um, podcasters in Beijing just talking to several folks here. I was amazed by how many other people have their own podcasts. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, we started Environment China about almost two years ago, maybe, I guess, a year and a half since we launched. Um, several of us who all who worked in the environmental field in China at various environmental NGOs or foundations um, ha, were already part of an organization called the Beijing Energy Network, which was putting on bi-weekly events featuring speakers, um, practitioners in the environmental field. And the basic thought was right now, um, you know, there's a lot going on in the world, um, but it's increasingly apparent that the role that China is playing in climate space um, in terms of environmental protection is increasingly important and it's increased, therefore increasingly important that people have an understand of, understanding of what's going on. Um, so we, you know, we started as d definite uh, amateurs. None of us had really worked much in journalism or in, um, in podcasts and radio, so we kind of um, learned on the go. But um, I think the beauty of podcasting is it, it can be a really accessible medium to learn. Um, so we, our, our show has followed an interview format. We've, I think to date we've interviewed over 50 guests. Um, and starting about a year ago, we launched our Chinese language podcast. So currently we have our English language podcast, which publishes every two weeks, and a Chinese language one, which also publishes every two weeks. Um, the basic goal is just we want to promote work being done by people, um, t featuring voices of, you know, Folks who are already, um, you know, accredited or known experts in the field, or young people who are starting their own companies, who are kind of finding their own voice, um, and just hoping that our podcast can start as a can serve as a conversation starter and also as a resource for anyone studying um, Chinese environmental issues. So I'll end up there. Yeah. Thanks, though, and I think that's um, something I did want to bring up is that tonight's panel is in English, and all the podcasts here are in English. And I guess, uh, yeah, June, the next one is the only one working in a non-native language on the podcast, but I think hopefully this is at least still a start for growing um, podcasting in China, still being kind of a uh, nascent uh, form of journalism here. So with that, we'll move on to, yeah, June, you could talk a little bit about the origins of the woman podcast. Um, first, uh, thank you so much for organizing the event. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, compared with the environment in China, we are still quite young. So we are going to have our one year anniversary on this Saturday and at Bookworm, so <laughs> shamelessly self-promotion and feel free to stop by, it's free. Um, so, uh, Woman Podcast. If you look at the, the name is put together, it's a woman. And if you separate it, pronounce it in Chinese, it's a woman. So the reason that we ha want to have this name is, first it is you know, given by a very smart friend, and the reason we want to have this podcast is because 
uh, both Jing Jing and I, Jing Jing and I, we are good friends and we are podcast listeners. And for a long time, we feel like most of podcasts about China um, are produced by mostly uh, foreigners or expats who live in China. Uh, we didn't see a lot of Chinese people, uh, particularly Chinese women, to have an English podcast. And we feel like that's something we can do. So that's how we came, came out with the idea. Um, luckily, both Jing Jing and me, we can speak English you know, decently. Uh, and we're also surrounded by a lot of friends who are super interesting, international, and they have a lot of things to say. So that's why we start with this podcast. We want to introduce about China. Uh, not, not only about women issue, but you know, China in general, from a Chinese woman's perspective, from inside of China. So all of our episodes so far are taped in Beijing. Um, so yeah, as a Chinese woman, you know, a lot of our stories and interviews are from female perspective. For example, like we interviewed um, co-founder of uh, Great Leap, um, Liu Fang. I, I think a lot of people heard a story about you know how they found the Great Leap from Carl's perspective, the other co-founder, the husband. So we interviewed the wife, and they, she has a very different angle about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also you know did a an episode about sexual consent, because recently there's a bunch of uh, sexual scandals where, you know, discussion uh, in the exp expat, particularly foreign correspondent community. So we did that episode, you know, try to uh, share the information with different ideas um, from both men and women perspective. But other than that, we also want to, you know, give um, our listeners t some um, interesting taste about, like, what's ordinary Chinese people's life. For example, recently we did an episode about, you know, uh, International Children's Day. So Jing Jing, Jing and I, we shared our um, beautiful memory about childhoods. For example, like what kind of a snack food we had uh, when we were in elementary school, after school, you know, what kind of stuff we look forward to. And during Chinese Spring Festival, you know, uh, what's the memory, what's the, you know, the, the, the great things about Spring Festival, the fragrance of my mom's cook is deep, deep in my memory. So that's kind of a detailed uh, daily life is some story we want to tell in this podcast. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we'll move on to John, who co-hosts China Tech Talk with um, Matthew Brennan um, of China Channel? China Channel, yeah, yeah exactly. Great. So um, so my background is actually radio. I did. Uh, I worked at China Radio International for about six years. Um, and even, even at that time, I knew that I wanted to do a podcast. So actually, China Tech Talk is, I think, the only surviving podcast out of about three or four that I've done, that I've done so far. Uh, when I was at CRI, I tried to do like, a, um, like an, interview, an interview show. It just, you know, it's, it's all about, I think a lot of it's just about passion and kind of keeping, keeping disciplined. So that died. Um, I did, um, I did <laughs> it, was, it was very amateurish as well. I think a lot of people here have had projects that have kind of fizzled out and this right. is a reincarnation of something. Right. Um, and then um, if you guys remember Charlie Custer, he's been gone for quite some time, but he and I uh, did a podcast called uh, China Punks. And that was, that was a lot of fun because he's, um, he's a bit cantankerous. Uh, I'm a bit cantankerous. And so one of the shows that I was working on at CRI was um, kind of about Chinese social issues, but because it's Chinese state media, there's certain things that you can't talk about or certain things that you have to be careful about how you talk about. And so we, I did China Punks as kind of a way to like just get it all out and like just, just say, say bad words about stuff that's happening um, here in China. Um, so when I joined TechNote about two years ago, uh, one of the things that I, I knew that I wanted to do a podcast, and it was just a question of figuring out how to actually do that. Um, and I, I found, uh, especially in my experience with Charlie, that working with a partner is um, very effective because uh, it's going to be a lot easier in a lot of ways. Like you don't have the primary burden of thinking of all the episodes, of um, of really kind of you know, especially if it's an interview interview format, reaching out to all the guests, figuring out what you're going to talk about. And so Matt and I, we've we've developed a pretty good um, unspoken in a sense uh, workflow where um, he and I kind of work together to do to do a lot of the booking, um, but then uh, he ends up writing most of the questions, uh, and I end, I end up doing uh, most of the uh, the post production. But um, 
so yeah, I knew that I wanted to do a podcast. I knew that I wanted to do it about China, about Chinese tech. Um, and it was kind of funny because actually Matt and I, we only met face to face maybe about six months or so after we started actually doing the podcast together. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's one of those things. So I, I got into a lot of WeChat groups. I noticed that he was uh, very knowledgeable um, and uh, a bit of a, a bit of an influencer in a certain sense. It's like okay, he seems like a good guy. You know, you can growth hack that 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 pretty pretty easily. Um, and in a lot of ways, I mean, what 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 we do at Technode, uh, what I want to do with China Tech Talk as well, is um, educate the world about China through the lens of of technology. Um, I think that there's a, a lot of misconceptions on the one hand. Um, there's there's a lot of uh, prejudice. There's also a lot of I think. Um, unjustified adulation as well. Um, but then also in, in the tech space especially, there's just not enough information in English. Um, and that's one of the things that we try to solve with TechNode. And then China Tech Talk was a way to, um, to really dive deep into some of, these, some of these topics that don't really get um, enough discussion. Um, and it's kind of funny, it's, it's a, it's my, my initial um, idea for the podcast was to do something more like Stratechery. Uh, which, if you haven't listened to it, it's an amazing podcast with uh, Ben Thompson and James Allworth uh, about technology, mostly looking at uh, U.S. tech companies. But it, that's purely a conversational show, um, and that was kind of my my, my first idea. Um, Matt Matt had some some different ideas and kind of wanted to, uh, in part, use it as a way to um, to kind of gain access to people that we wouldn't necessarily have access to otherwise, um, and it's just kind of gone from there. So at this point, we do about. Maybe 50-50, so we do about 50% uh, conversational, 50% interview, um, and I think a lot of it's just kind of like, okay, w w do you have something to talk about? Do you have a, do you have a good guest? Um, does does having this specific guest on make uh, make sense for us? Um, and there's been there's been a few cases where we've had to, we've had some inbound um, requests for for guests, and we've had to turn them down because they're either not relevant or well, relevant in the sense in the sense of kind of what we want to do. Or, but also relevant in the sense that we don't think they have enough credibility among our potential audience. It's not, it's not someone who someone, like let's say, you know, everyone's super busy, right? And so um, as a listener, you have to decide, okay, what do I actually want to devote my attention to? Um, and I think that to be a good po podcast listener, you kind of have to uh, really pay attention. Um, but yeah, so that's, that, that's basically it. I mean, again, I think the biggest thing for us is really just being able to dive deep into um, topics that don't really get covered as well as they should sometimes. And last but not least, uh, the biggest fish in the Middle Kingdom, just kidding, uh, well, Brenda Davis. <laughs> well, I'm on a diet, but uh, in theory, in theory. Um, so Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom is meant as a tongue-in-cheek name, first of all, because I've had a few people sort of say, are you saying you're a big fish? What's a, a little, but you have to understand the construct. I mean, this is the biggest kingdom of all, you know, the biggest pond of all. And so my show is focused on fellow foreigners who come here to do something that's ambitious or unusual and often kind of crazy. And so the shows that I like the most, that have the most impact, I mean, you mentioned in the write-up, uh, WTF, uh, or actually Kyle mentioned that in the thing he wrote about us. But, um, you know, um, Mark Maron's show, Tim Ferriss's show, Guy Raz, How I Built This, although my show doesn't technically seem to line up with guys, you know, I'm sort of, uh, John mentioned, interview versus conversational, and I'm sort of, sort of a hybrid format a bit. I mean, I do have a lot of written questions, but I basically have a framework that I send the guests, and then we, we start with the same basic question, and then it kind of goes where it goes. And, you know, off mic or as we go, I'll tell them, say, hey, so, you know, where do you want to end with this? And then I'll you know, cut that out, usually, unless I forget. Uh, yeah, that's been embarrassing. Good thing you can recall episodes that you posted. I've had to do that twice when I've been editing in a hurry. But so the show has been a lot of fun because uh, the really short version of my story is basically I've been back and forth here from Los Angeles about five years. I've worked in entertainment my whole life. And I have a lot of friends who do shows. I've done radio myself back in the States. And, you know, as many friends as I have here and all the different, I mean, my, pro my work is very project-based. I'm like in film and TV world mostly, uh, producing and consulting primarily. And so it's very intense relationships and then you don't see people ever again. So I don't have a continuity of, oh, I'm going to go hit this office and see these same people every day and eat the same place. That, that doesn't really exist for me. It never really has. So it's not that I miss it, but what I do miss is living in like my neighborhood that I had and the friends I had and the people I would see in the regular places. And so this was my way to kind of build a community, frankly, that I could be part of. And so it's not meant, 
it has practically had a Beijing focus just because I live here, but, and because I don't love doing Skype interviews, I've done them and I do remote ones when I need to, but it's really about anyone who's come to China. And so my goal for the show moving forward uh, is to actually start traveling more. And when I travel for work to be able to do interviews with people who are in these little nooks and crannies. And there are some other announcements that we'll save for later in the, in the night here, but that's kind of the show in a nutshell. It's a great teaser. Um, so one of the things that John brought up that I wanted the other guests to touch on is sort of basically how being in Beijing has influenced your podcast from a topical perspective. Because if you notice here, all, I guess, pretty much every podcast is looking through a specific topical lens. Um, and I think that that sort of is shaped in tandem with this idea of being in Beijing. So I'm curious, maybe we could go back, start with Brendan this time, and then move back toward um, Yajun. In terms of how it shaped the actual yeah. the actual show, well, because Beijing is the capital city, and it's you know it's Beijing, Shanghai, and sometimes Guangzhou. Maybe you want to arm wrestle over this, but you tend to find a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of very ambitious people, kind of world changing minded folks here. So that's I would say that my show skews really heavily. I mean, I basically I, I have people who are kind of artists trying to find their way. Had a really interesting comedian English teacher that's going to drop uh, in a week or two, so you don't have to be like a titan of industry or something. But I've skewed really heavily toward entrepreneurs and entertainment folks. Just that's kind of my world, and so being in Beijing has influenced my show because of who you meet. So they're the people that I know. But for instance, I mean, I you know. I got to know AJ in entrepreneurs organization and have met all these people through there. So I've had like five or six members of that group on the show, et cetera. And so that's, I would say that it's sort of, the tendency is that there's a bit of a bubble that I work to try to subvert and get out of. But for me, that's kind of the main thing. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I feel like, I feel like a bit out of place because I'm not sure if Beijing has actually, being in Beijing actually has influenced the podcast. Um, I think that, I mean, you know, I've been living in Beijing for 10 years. Um, you know, I, I'm married, have two kids, very settled. Uh, Beijing is, is just kind of where I am. Um, but if you, if you push me a little bit more, I mean, you know, Beijing is, is uh, really, in, 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 in one sense, it is the capital of technology in China. Um, certainly, you know, you're going to have a lot of international companies in Shanghai, a lot of hardware companies in Shenzhen, uh, and then, of course, you know, Alibaba basically owns all of Hangzhou. Um, but in, in Beijing, you know, once, once a tech company gets to a certain level of maturity, they're going to set up shop here. I mean, you know, Tencent, for example, they're based in Shenzhen, but one of their largest offices is in, is in Beijing. Uh, Mobike was uh, founded in uh, Shanghai, but they moved their headquarters uh, last year here, here to Beijing. Um, Didi, founded by ex-Alibaba ex out of Hangzhou, headquartered here in Beijing. Um, so, again, I'm not sure, you know, to what degree that's actually influenced the podcast, but certainly, you know, in, in Beijing does have a very vibrant um, entrepreneurial community. And, and also, I think that one of the reasons that I wanted to start the podcast uh, was because uh, I'm pretty introverted. Um, I, I work from home most of the time, and I don't, I don't get a chance to talk to many people. Um, so, so the podcast in some ways, actually I wanted to do another, another podcast with, uh, with a friend of mine. It ended up not working out, but, um, but basically, you know, one of, one of, another one of my goals is to have interesting conversations. Um, and I think that being able to live in a place like Beijing, come to events like this, uh, meet, meet cool people. So it might not have a direct influence on, on the podcast itself, but certainly the conversations that I have with, with, with everyone um, certainly influences my thinking and influences the directions of the conversation um, and, and, and also, you know, directs kind of our coverage on TechNote as well. So kind of answers the question. Um, for us, actually, both Jingjing and, and I, we grew up uh, in the north of China. I grew up in Tianjin. It's only 30 minutes by train away from Beijing. And Jinjin was born in Shandong and then moved here. Um, so it's, we, we never claim as like a Beijing-based podcast, but you know, because both of us come from the north of China, so you can see that you know, the food we talk about, the, the school experience that we talk about, were typical you know, northerners' experience. Um, and also, uh, because there's a 
um, the community here is more like, like, like John said, you know, uh, there's a lot of tech companies, some of our friends, they, they're from the tech industry. Uh, there's a big community of a foreign correspondents. So we are very close to this community. Uh, some of our guests are from the uh, foreign correspondent group. Uh, and also some interviewees, you know, have a, you know, a lot of like um, uh, Beijing background. For example, like we are, we went to interview a collector uh, last weekend. So he's much, you know, typical Beijing, or, you know, he was like wearing beam, you know, big necklace of a big beam and <laughs> with shou chuar and all of that. And when we walk into uh, his, his house, it was basically a museum. And the, the first question he tests us is like, do you know when Beijing became the capital of a dynasty? So of course my my um, answer was wrong, and you know <laughs> it was just such a shame because when I'm married to a historian, I should know, but I got that wrong. So he pretty much you know said that oh you're not qual qualified as a Beijinger. I'm not. I'm Tianjinger. <laughs> so um, yeah, but it's very interesting. You know, living in Beijing, there's a big community. You know, there's thinker. There are people working in entertainment industry, people working in tech industry, in environmental industry. I, I feel like there's um, you know mix of, you know, different background and huge variety. Um, I know there's a big community of a podcaster in uh, Shanghai as well, um, but, you know, a lot of people that I talk to feels like there's more business environment in, in Shanghai, rather, but in Beijing it's more political, more cultural uh, tech. That's something that I'm really into. And then just to add two points about, um, I mean, obviously, you know, with a Beijing Energy Network uh, launching this podcast, Beijing definitely uh, does have its footprint on our podcast. I think um, just thinking about what the environmental and climate community is in China, um, if, if you want to do anything that's policy related, you come to Beijing because that's where the government is. And I think that um, we probably more of our guests than maybe our, our listeners well, might care for are policy oriented because um, that's a lot of the people that we're surrounded with. Um, also because of registration laws, so many organizations tend to have their headquarters in Beijing. So I think we, we get a lot of the international registered people. I think as Yajin was mentioning, Shanghai and maybe Shenzhen have types, there could be some green startup business communities that we haven't really tapped yet. Um, every single one of our episodes, I think, for except for two, we've recorded in Beijing. Um, we had a couple we, at the UN Climate Conference interviewing Chinese people who are kind of going abroad, and I think that's actually perhaps a direction that we may be going. Um, sadly, Kate and some of our other members of the podcast team are, are definitely going um, back to the U.S., moving abroad, and I think hopefully the podcast will continue with them where they go, and I think because... China, as China's environmental and climate leadership and footprint um, increasingly goes beyond its borders, I think there'll be more and more opportunities to, to talk to Chinese guests who are living outside of China. Um, I wanted to take a minute to ask how many people in the audience here have their own podcast or are thinking about starting a podcast or some involvement in podcasting? So just for the audio, we probably have about a third to half of hands raised here. Um, which is pretty impressive. Um, you know, when you're looking at podcasters in Beijing, we're like, we don't know what this community is, so hopefully this could be a start for more contact among those of us actually doing podcasts here. But as you might be familiar with, one of the biggest questions is basically format for the show. Um, and this involves a number of different things. You know, do you want to do an interview-focused format? Do you want to try and be more of a storyteller, more conversational? Also, especially in China, the language question is a huge issue. Um, so I want to give each of our guests a chance to talk a little bit about how they determine the format uh, for the show, and maybe let's see, start with um, let's start with Noah. Okay. <laughs> Begrudgingly, um, I think for for, uh, for us a couple of things. One uh, interview podcast in my mind are probably the most uh, straightforward. Don't require a lot of prep. You know, you you can always kind of think of some questions. That it maybe takes me minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and I, the other piece is that uh, when we started the podcast, some members of our team were more established in the environmental space in China, but um, myself, I wasn't. Kate had a couple of years of experience, but I think it's, um, you know, as a 
podcast that's really set up to be an information provider. If you're not already an expert, then it's um, you're gonna have to do a lot of homework to kind of prepare, um, you know, your talking points about what's going on. So it, just from that perspective, I think it's it's been a huge learning experience for us. Um, but it's made a lot of sense to to go find the people who who know what they're talking about and to have them them share their their wisdom, their knowledge. Um, we've we've been trying to do more creative, more storytelling formats, but it um, I think. You know, while podcasts can be a very accessible thing for anyone to try, there's, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, there are podcasts like, you know, This American Life, which might spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, it's ra yeah. Radio show, right. But there are, there are podcasts which might spend, you know, a lot of, invest a lot of time and money into actually producing a, a well-crafted story. I'll just, as the mo I know I'm the moderator, but I'm going to jump in as well. Um, we mentioned that we also have a Chinese language episode. So one of the other challenges, again, was the language question. And um, there's a lot of really good guests. And one of our goals is basically to have people who are working on the ground tell their stories to an audience that's broader than that just here in Beijing and here in China. Uh, but language is definitely a challenge. So we have our, a couple members of our Chinese team here. Um, launched that about a year ago, and I think that's um, a great way to share more of those stories, although still, um, you know, a question to get someone who's a really incredible, for example, like a lawyer working on environmental public interest litigation, telling that story in a non-native language can be, you know, difficult in many of these situations, and we want to get those stories out there, so it's definitely um, a challenge that's not completely solved, but excited to be in two languages, and that was you know, a huge step forward. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Actually, what we have, Woman Podcast, what we have right now is not what I want, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I want exactly what you just mentioned. I want a podcast like this. I want a podcast like This American Life. Uh, that's the reason why I wanted to start a podcast. Um, maybe it's a radio show, but I think that's, that's my ultimate goal. Um, but, you know, like Noah said, it takes forever. <laughs> to produce, <laughs> yeah, to produce the show like that, it, 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 that's tens of work. Uh, both Jingjing and I, we have our full-time job. Sometimes we need to work like 60 or 70 hours each week. So it's really, really exhausting job. So the only time we have is either, you know, during the weekend or, you know, the Jingjing live in Tongzhou and her workplace is in uh, Haidian. So she has one and a half hour commute one way, it, yeah, each day, actually three hours both way. So she used that time to edit our podcast. Um, yeah, no, she <laughs> she has a DD. Yeah, she used DD. Um, yeah, so yeah, in terms of the resources and time, we really don't have a lot. So that's why we end up have this you know conversational interview format. And it took us a while to think about you know what, which language we should use. Uh, at the beginning, you know, we were thinking about you know both of us are Chinese, and you know Chinese language will have much bigger audience, and it will be so much easier for us to find interviewees. After all, there are only there are more and more uh, English-speaking Chinese interviewees, but you know sometimes we still you know has a lot of difficulties to find interviewees. But the reason that we want to stick to English is because we feel like there's a voice is missing. We, we really hear a lot of Chinese people doing English uh, podcast, and we feel like you know that's something we really can help. And we are so lucky have this privilege to be surrounded by a lot of people who can explain their experience and. Who really have interesting experience to share. So that's why we end up you know, doing the English podcast. But I do feel like the audience space is much smaller because of the language issue. Uh, if we do this in Chinese, put it on the Himalaya, you know, we'll have a much bigger audience base. But only because the language, a lot of you know, my parents, you know, our relatives, our friends, some of them, you know, Actually, many of them cannot understand what I'm talking about. My mom keeps asking me, what are you guys talking about for an hour each episode? You, you have to translate for me. I said, yeah, that takes forever. Um, so, so I would say that um, uh, when it comes to format, um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty lazy. Uh, and, and, and I also come from radio. Um, I remember 
so when I first started working at CRI, I would put together maybe three, four, five minute packages, and those would take a good, you know, three or four days to put together. Um, and so, you know, you look at something like Radio Lab, and from a production standpoint, oh my God, Radio Lab is amazing. It's so amazing how well they put everything together. But then if you have any idea of what takes place in the back end, you realize like each episode takes weeks, maybe even months to, to, to actually put together. Um, so on the one hand, I'm lazy. Uh, on the other hand, I'm kind of a live to tape guy. Um, so I know that some, some podcast producers, they will uh, be very detail oriented and take out all the ums and the ahs and, and the things like that. I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, what I do is I will listen to the entire episode and edit out any mistakes. Um, I will do my best to make it sound as good as possible. So, there, so I use um, Adobe Edition, and there's some really interesting things that you can do with Adobe Edition to make your, yourself and your, your co-host sound really, really nice. Um, also, the microphone is super important as well. Um, so that's one of the big reasons that... Um, that we're kind of doing our format. And, and again, I mean, so we have like 50-50 conversational, 50-50 um, uh, interview. And so the first few episodes that Matt and I did together, uh, we prepared our asses off. Um, we got everything ready. We had like not, not a script, but an outline. And then we talked for like 30 or 45 minutes. And, and it, went, it went pretty well. And then our first, uh, our first interview podcast was like, wow. It's so easy, <laughs> you know, because all you because like the hardest part about an interview about an interview podcast is booking the guest, yeah. right? I mean, like, oh my, like the amount of time that you can spend confirming confirming schedules, back and forth, all that stuff. I mean, oh my god, it's a huge pain in the ass. Um, but once you get them on, there's no you have no pressure. All you're, you're the only thing that you're there to do is like what Kate's doing tonight is just to guide the conversation. <laughs> Kind of. <laughs> kind of. So, so it's a low bar. It's, it's a low bar. Yeah. It's, I'm lazy. I don't but have the, to do any the work. The booking of the guests is definitely difficult. <laughs> um, so, so that's one of the big reasons that, that I mean, and so why, why are we doing 50-50? I mean, on, on the one hand, it's work, but it's also on the other hand, on the other hand um, you know, I think that Matt and I, we feel that, on, that, that, that we have something to offer through our conversation because he's a real expert in digital marketing uh, and WeChat. Um, and in social networks and, and kind of social e-commerce as well. Like his job is basically to go around giving, uh, doing consulting and presentations on, on these topics. So he's a real expert. Um, whereas for me, I'm, I'm much more of a conceptual kind of person. I like to think through things and figure out what it means and, and think about where, where things fit. And so I think that both of us have something, I mean, to be a bit narcissistic, but we have something important to offer, uh, something important to say that we think people should listen to. And on the other hand, we also realize that we don't know everything. Um, and there's, there's a lot of experts out there, whether they work for a specific company that we're interested in knowing more about, whether they pay attention to a specific industry that we're, we're interested in knowing about. We recognize that there's a lot of people out there that know a ton more than we do. Um, and so a lot of it's just a question of um, figuring out, okay, who do we actually want to come on um, and going through the, the logistical nightmare of, of getting them on. Um, and then, you know, do we have something important to say? Uh, and that's really kind of how, how we go, go with it. I mean, like, I think the last four or five episodes have been, uh, have been interviews, and then we're going to be recording one uh, this weekend or, or on Monday, kind of giving me a chance to go through some ideas that, that I've been having. Um, I'm going write to write, publish a piece about this tomorrow, and then I want to be able to talk about it with him. Um, and so it's a really great way to kind of, for me in a sense, to really kind of work through some of these ideas and figure out what it means. And also from, from a conversational perspective, get, get someone else's opinion and get someone else to weigh in and kind of help me figure it out together. I don't speak Chinese. I have more to say than that. Um, I guess I'm working on the Chinese. But for me, that's obviously dictates, but also the focus of mine is really aimed at kind of, you know, I mean, I do it for its enjoyment and it's it's a way to, again, have a sense of security, create a sense of community. And I'm curious for the learning experience of how other people did the things they do. Uh, John's been on the show and that was great, like learning, going in depth to really you know, learn his process and just get to know him too. Um, but for me, my, my kind of, my overarching meta goal is to flatten the world a little bit and try to you know, keep us from blowing each other up and my small little part of that. So making it more understandable and more relatable. I want people, you know, quote unquote, back home, meaning not China, wherever that is, to be able to understand weirdos like us who would come and do this. 
and to also give kind of like a little bit of a light for people who, oh, maybe I could do that too, you know. So my focus is English language listeners. Having said that, I want to reactivate my Shimalaya channel, and I know they're coming out with the English side, but that it's going to be, you know, separate from the main site. So that's a goal for me, but yeah, I don't speak Chinese well. <laughs> So, so sorry. So Matt and I have actually we've talked about doing doing Chinese, and um, I come from the from like the tech entrepreneurial kind of kind of background almost. Or that's kind of the the uh, the milieu that I'm in right now. Um, and for me, I mean, a lot of it is just about addressable market. Um, and for what for what we can provide, the addressable market is much much larger in in English. I mean, yes, of course, there's there's a huge audience in China, but at least like kind of kind of what we what we can do, what we can provide. Um, you know, we need to target you know, an international audience, and that's that's one of the big reasons. Also, we've kind of we've kind of discussed like how can we like we've thought about having uh, a Chinese speaking guest on, um, and so they like maybe we can speak Chinese and they and like they can answer in Chinese or something like that. But the problem has always been production wise, like like so if they're if they're giving an answer in Chinese, and that means that you need to get like a third voice. You start you and your co-host and them, so a fourth voice actually, to do the voiceover, and you got to produce that. And Matt and I were talking about it. He was pretty gung ho about it. I was like, dude, no. I mean, like, no. I'm 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 <laughs> I barely have enough time as it is. I'm just I'm just not gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, a friend of mine and I to interject really fast. A friend of mine and I, he really wanted to do that. And some of the guests would be English, some would be Chinese. We were, we were going to do the whole you know BBC voiceover thing where you hear them fade down. The, and production wise, we're both like, are we kidding? We're both trying to like you know run a company and pay the bills. This is no way. Makes sense. Um, so we've been pretty meta here so far. Um, and I'm going to challenge you for, as typical hosts, um, to get a little bit more tangible in terms of storytelling. I want you to pick one moment, either a favorite guest, um, a favorite uh, podcast episode that you worked on, or maybe a particular episode that was challenging for one reason or another, such as, uh, yeah, Jim was just mentioning the story with the Lal Beijing Rana. Um, <laughs> um, and share that with the audience. Um, and let's start with a John, I see your thinking cap on over there, and we've been starting with the end. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 I think that um, there's been so many episodes that after you record, um, you're like, this is why I'm doing it. The, the, the recording button stops, and, and you're like, wow, that was, uh, you know, 45, 50 minutes, an hour of just like, this is exactly what, what this is exactly why I'm doing this. Um, but I guess the problem is it's happened, it's, I feel pretty lucky, it's happened quite often. Um, so it's hard for me to pick out, I mean, there's, there's a few. Um, one, I mean, actually, so we just, we just published two episodes, anniversary episodes, kind of highlighting some of, the, uh, some of our, our best episodes, so maybe you guys can listen to that. Um, but one of, one of my favorites that really sticks out is one that, uh, that Matt and I did, it was just, just he and I, um, and it was, Again, so a chance for me to kind of really kind of think about what 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 it all means, um, and think about and try to fit fit some of these things into place. And so, the idea when we first started that, that the episode was going to be a, a reference episode, so an episode that we can refer people back to, where we talk about some of these higher level concepts, some of these uh, broader trends, and, and the context of what kind of what's all what's going on. Because you know, when we first started, we just died right into it. Um, I, our first episode, our first interview episode was with Florian Bonert from Mobike, um, and then, you know, we just had so, ma so many people, and even the conversational episodes that we had were um, still very specific, and we didn't have the time to really go in and explain every single thing, uh, and so what we thought was that we would go and um, just try to explain some of, again, some of the, some of the, the bigger things. Um, other other ones, I mean, like, I mean, again, almost every single interview episode that we've done has been amazing. Um, the one with um, Thomas Graziani from Walk the Chat was especially enjoyable. Um, oh yeah, actually, so not not Eli So the, the episode with Elijah Whaley, we did two episodes with Elijah Whaley. He's the CMO of a um, of Park Lou. He that's a a KOL a KOL digital management platform. Uh, so it's a way for companies to find uh, influencers, uh, Chinese influencers online, and contract them to uh, basically promote products and, and, thing, and brands and things like that. Um, but Elijah, I mean, like he's just so on top of his game, and he's so smart, 
and like he's he's the CMO of a marketing company, um, and he was able to really come on and explain to us like why and how what we're seeing is this this uh, the sea change in how people consume content and their relationship with brands, uh, and and so I think that 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 was I, if I really had to choose one, that's probably one of my favorite ones. Yeah, who wants to go next? Now you've had a few minutes to think about your story. <laughs> Um, it's a great question, and I mean, you know, next to John, I mean, he's right here, he can hear me. Uh, that was a really good episode, I really enjoyed that. What I can say that's kind of a, a, a general overarching comment is that there have been many episodes that have just really impacted me. I mean, when I'm doing my show, this sort of alludes to what he said and what they may say as well, and, and I know a bunch of people in the audience who do podcasts. I mean, it has changed me profoundly. I've met people that have changed my perspective, have increased my, my livelihood, my point of view. I have multiple really close friends who I've made from doing this show. I have, right now, four different business partners, like different ventures that are all contributing to my life and my livelihood in some way, who I've met from this show. And it wasn't some crass maneuver. I'm not quite that smart. It was things that developed organically. And from sitting with somebody, because I also do a bit of a pregame, depending on the person. It's either 10 minutes, or sometimes it's an hour and a half, and we go, oh shit, we have to record now. <laughs> but you know, we do the pregame, uh, sometimes we'll do a lunch or a dinner beforehand or whatever, so you get to really know people a bit, at least in the kind of show I'm doing. And so, depending on the topic, what John was saying about having shows that become a reference. It's like, oh, if someone wants to understand the entertainment business, I have like three or four shows I can point people to. If you want to understand the Chinese movie industry, these are some of the best people working. If you want to under, understand entrepreneurship, I've got you know half dozen people who have all built really successful companies under the top of their game, et cetera, et cetera, nonprofit stuff. So I can't highlight any one in particular, but if there's a topic that anyone's curious about, uh, message me and I'll be happy to recommend a couple of good ones. Yeah, June? Um, I, I totally agree. I think doing podcasts is right now one of the best part of my life um, because every single episode we have in-depth conversation with each single guest and they really open up their, their heart their mind to us and explain um, generously explain their life to us and you know for example like some guests cried in the studio and others had a big love talking about their really personal life. I really appreciate that. I think so far, one of the most difficult episodes we did and, um, is the sexual consent episode. Um, so for, for people who are not very uh, familiar with the background, um, recently there was a quite a big incident in the foreign correspondent um, community is that you know the former president of um, uh, FCC Foreign Correspondent Club of China was accused of a sexual assault by another reporter. And so, because I, I was a foreign media, I, I come from a foreign media background and I know a lot of people and I, I know how heated this, this discussion was and I, I know a lot of people who got involved. So actually that was the biggest um, editorial decision between Jingjing and me, we were thinking about it. This is a, such an important topic because from the discussion we can see that, you know, people have a really um, big dis disagreement about what is sexual consent. So we will discuss, you know, whether we should do an episode about it, you know, because we are really ignorant about it. And I'm sure other people have a very little knowledge about that too. So uh, we ended up doing an episode because, you know, the, the reason we want to do it is just, we want to learn more ourselves and we have very limited knowledge about that. Um, we, at the beginning, we asked about, you know, asked a bunch of people who get involved and they really don't want to, be on the record about this story. So we kind of give up on this. And luckily, uh, at the end, you know, one of the correspondent, uh, actually, if you listen to the podcast, is Yang Yuan, who is the, the tech reporter from Financial Times. Actually, she has a lot of experience, provide like workshop about sex, sexual con consent since her college period. So yeah, she was very generous, you know, get on the show with us and explain, you know, not get into the detail of the case because 
none of us know exactly what's happened, happened, but she explained the sexual consent, consent, you know, from her perspective, from her experience. And to be honest, through that episode, I learned so much. So, and at the same time, we were very careful about not getting into the, any individual case because there's a lot of nuance, you know, getting involved. But I think it's important the process for us to, you know, get into a discussion, um, even though it's a tough dis di di discussion, but, you know, have people bring in people and who has much more knowledge and experience than us and our audience to give their perspective. Um, one thing I was really, to be honest, after that episode, I, I have no idea um, how people would react. I was really concerned because, you know, it's such a sensitive topic. You know, in that discussion, a lot of men have a very strong opinion about this and women as well. So I was prepared to be, you know, yelled at, you know, to be, you know, screamed at um, for that. But the, the outcome was really great, and a lot of people came to me saying that actually we learned a lot. This is a very constructive conversation, constructive discussion. So that's exactly what we want to do. We don't want to you know, point fingers about each individual case. We just want to provide a voice, uh, provide some background, provide some perspectives into the you know, various topics with discussion. So that's exactly what we want to do from a woman podcast. Yeah. I think that's great, and that sort of hits on one of the things about podcasting that's unique is that you can have a very personal conversation and then share that very widely um, so that it doesn't just remain within a certain subgroup and get that out there. Um, Noah? Yeah, thinking about favorite podcast, um, I think, you know, as a, we, you know, we do, we interview people about oftentimes very technical topics, so maybe it's, um, you know, green finance, the, China's reforms of the power market, um, and you know, and we know our our audience. It's a people are not always going to be interested in in these particular issues. Um, so the challenge is always, at least the things we've kind of set out as goals is, um, you know, one we want our as much as possible. I think often, you know, when, when you think about what radio shows or podcasts people often really like, it's these really story driven. Uh, shows and I think with an interview show there are, if you have great guests people who are just like really um, gifted you know gabbers uh, th then maybe you don't need as much of a story arc but as much as possible we, um, I think our best episodes have been people who can really tell a, a, a story about a specific project they did about um, the story of how they founded their company those types of stories really lend themselves well I think to podcasts um, and then the other thing is you know when you're when you're talking about some of these um, often, especially, I think people feel like when they're hearing about environmental issues, it's like getting beat over the head, um, or maybe it feels really dry. And so, like being able to make an emotional connection, I think, is is something that we're always um, aiming for. So, the, the episode that came to mind when you asked that question, um, we interviewed a, a senior, uh, an irrigation engineer at the World Bank. Um, so, it, it definitely had the potential to be a very technical and perhaps dry story, um, but he had this. Um, he had a project. He had gone up to Xinjiang for worked there for a decade, um, and basically seen this area go from the you know the water levels were dropping you know a meter every year, um, lakes had dried up, forests were falling over because there just wasn't any water in this area. And the story of how you go in, figure out what's going on, and and move forward with the project. And um, but I think the thing that I remember most about that interview is just how personally. You know, he, he was a Chinese man, and just the sense of kind of national, this beautiful nationalism of, of going in there and helping his country in this way. Um, you know, he's, a, he's an old, serious man, but there was like a little tear in his eye as he was talking about, you know, at the end of this decade-long project, they had kind of re they had restored um, water to this area. Um, so just have, being able to tell a story and, and, and have a real emotional connection is something that um, we're always aiming for and was excited to have at that episode. So uh, last question from me as the moderator, and I'm going to turn it into sort of two questions at once, actually. Um, so uh, we'll start with no on this one and then head that way. Um, basically, either or your advice to any future or aspiring podcasters um, or any future plans for your podcast that you'd like to share with the audience. Sure, I'll keep it short. Um, the advice that we got when we started was, um, one, just keep going. You know, the more you do it, 
the more practice you have, the better you'll be. And two, um, actually seek out feedback because uh, it's it's easy to keep going on your course, but I think asking people whether or not they actually like it, what they like, what they don't like, is um, incredibly necessary if you want to grow your audience. Um, our experience taught us, you know, just do it. <laughs> The first episode is like really Nike. difficult. It took us forever. Actually, I thought about this podcast for for years. I never had the, the courage to really do it. But you know, have a, a team member who push it, push each other. You know, really helps. So you know, actually, Junya and I, we did not, neither of us has any podcast or radio background. I was a reporter. Junjin is a you know PR specialist. Wore her you know. Uh, during her entire career um, experience. Um, so, you know, we just used a really small recorder at the beginning, and the sound quality was really, 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 really awful. And then we end up, you know, putting our own money to run the studio, and then after that, it's too expensive for us, and then we move on to buying this uh, decent recorder, but you know, we, we have a no technology background and we still haven't figured out how to use our, um, how to use our microphone. Um, <laughs> <As the> microphone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, we yeah, so we're really bad at it, but we'll still keep going. So just keep doing what you have been doing and eventually uh, your po podcast will be get heard. Oh, another thing, shamelessly promote your podcast. <laughs> if you haven't noticed yet. <laughs> um, so, so, so yeah, I mean, kind of going off of uh, uh, what, I'm just going to change you. Uh, what, what, what yeah, you yeah, no, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not your fault. Um, yeah, so, so technology is really important. Um, one of the things that I learned in radio is that you need a, you need a good microphone. Um, Sorry. Not that one. Sorry. Uh, do you need a, is this one? Okay. Uh, um, you need a good microphone. You really, you really, really need a good microphone. Can I, I'll just keep saying that until this, this one, this one works. Yeah. I'll just do, do it like this. Okay, there you go. It's more like a singing microphone, I guess, right? Um, so, so yeah, uh, microphones, super, super important, super, super important. Um, because basically, it's, it's, humans, humans are kind of stupid in a way where if, if something is of low quality, the, if, if, if the, the production value is, is, is of a certain quality, or, sorry again. Um, take two. Yes, take, take five. <laughs> um, so we, we, te we tend to correlate content quality with production quality. Right, and so so if it's of low quality, if the production, the recording is of low quality, we're going to assume that the content isn't worth listening to, or that the people speaking don't have any credibility. Uh, and the opposite is true of of, of high quality as well. So um, I've talked with uh, Kaiser Guo a little bit about what he does, and like I th I'm not sure how much he spent on his setup, but he spent a lot of money. Um, so if you ever listen to Seneca, you can hear that it comes out. Um, obviously, I don't have that type of money. I'm not as serious about it. Um, but you know, you spend a thousand, a thousand five hundred RMB on a USB mic, and that'll that'll set you up for however long that microphone lasts. Um, so technology is is really important. Um, also, one of the things that I, I I kind of learned early on is that um, you just got you just got to keep doing it. You really got, you just got to keep doing it because that's that's the real key to building up building an audience is consistency. Uh, and so Matt, when Matt and I were talking about doing a China Tech Talk, he was he was a bit um, um, concerned about the time commitment because it is a time commitment uh, uh, in doing it once a week. Uh, but I really really pushed because like you know if we if we want to do this we need to just keep keep publishing keep having content. Um, and to be honest, the way it's worked out is that. He and I have been super busy, and there's been times where we haven't been able to book a guest, we haven't been able to record. He's traveling all the time, um, and so we have had points where we just weren't able to publish for, I think, I think the longest we went was like a month. Um, but uh, but our but our goal is always once a week, and even and even though we might lose a bit of momentum after being gone for so long, we still do it, and and you know we still push each other to to do it. Um, I think that. It can be a little bit easy to get to to uh, to get discouraged, um, to say, oh, you know, no one's really listening, or no one's really giving me feedback, or or whatever. Um, but if but if you keep going, it you you that's that's really the way that that uh, that you build the audience. Um, and then yeah, marketing. I mean, you know, it's 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 
I honestly, I'm, I'm not very good at marketing my own stuff. Thank God, thank God Matt is. Um, he's, he's a, he really is a, he's a great, he's a genius when, when it comes to a lot of this stuff. I mean, the reason that we have kind of this bland name um, is because it's good for SEO. You know, people, I mean, seriously, it's good for SEO. People are going to do a search, and that's one of the first things that's going to it's going to pop up. Also, you know, like we're not we're not appealing to very cultured types, right? We're not um, really appealing to people who uh, appreciate a good turn of phrase. You know, uh, we're we're really just kind of trying to be very clear about what we're doing, and and then and then deliver on that. Um, and so, you know, we publish on. Um, on our podcast host that goes to, to iTunes and stuff. Uh, we publish on TechNode, but then we also have our own website that's dedicated to, to that. Um, and then we, we try to push it out as, as, as much as possible, so on LinkedIn, on Twitter. And also, I think one of the keys, I mean, I, I think the, the, for us at least, what's worked really well is kind of pushing, pushing episodes that we think are relevant to certain people. Um, because maybe they've never heard of you, maybe they know who you are, but they don't really know what you do. Uh, maybe they listen to the, the maybe they listen to the podcast sometimes, but really not that often. Um, and so, kind of pushing them um, to pushing some content to them, um, and then if they if they if they like it, if they think they they, they think it's relevant, that kind of kicks off the whole word of mouth chain. Um, and I think that's that's uh, one of the best ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah, we've definitely learned that if you ask your guests to share with their own network, it can be super powerful. So we just published an episode, super interesting, on um, environmental art in China, and it was with a Norwegian PhD, and we looked at our figures this week, and we're like, oh, wow, we have over 100 downloads from Norway. That's never happened before. And <laughs> in the past, we looked internationally, and we're like, okay, so there's a lot of international downloads, but we know a lot of them are because of VPNs, um, but this one, we're pretty sure, had some correlation with the, her sharing it with her network. Um, and we can also relate to you on the, the bland name for marketing purposes. <laughs> Well, you guys, I, I have officially the worst title for SEO. <laughs> woman is the most high concept. What's it about? It's about women. Uh, <laughs> all three of those are examples of what to do if you're trying to title your podcast for SEO. Mine is not. Uh, fortunately, mine has a cute graphic, though, thanks to my friend Ronald, who did the logo. Um, in terms of most of what I would say has been said, so I'll underline a few things and add my own two cents. Um, yes to a focus, so, so targeted audience. You know, have a niche, have a very specific niche. So I have a wide range of guests, but I have a very specific niche of what the show is. You know, environment. It's very women's issues in China specifically. It's China Tech Talk. These are all very focused shows, and within that focus, you can have a big range of guests. That's very helpful. So some some of the shows that come and go and don't last don't really have a clear focus, I don't think. Um, yes to all the technical stuff. I, the technical stuff comes easy for me, but still my first handful of episodes, I had to figure out the right way to do it, both you know, quality, quantity, right, the time commitment. And again, he was mentioned the roughly 1,000 RMB. I mean, the blue owes me some endorsement cred because I've probably got about a dozen people to buy a blue Yeti. It's, you know, for that, you've got one too. For that price point, it's a great mic, but it's very simple, keep it simple from my audio engineering past, like back in the dark ages, keep it very simple and clean. You don't have to, the more stuff you put in the process between the person talking and the listener's ears, the worse it's going to get. Um, so in terms of advice, you know, clear focus, be very clean with your equipment. Practice a, a, a bit, and um, I mean, various friends in the audience, I know, you know, um, AJ did some practice episodes, I know, Mike's done some practice episodes before releasing them and everything. If they come out great, then you can put it out. But if it doesn't come out so great, then you can just leave it as an experiment. But uh, in terms of the future, a lot of things going on and my, my work and my life all kind of intertwines. I guess I'm the one person, I mean, this doesn't pay the bills, but it's in the wheelhouse of my quote unquote day job to, to do this kind of stuff. But so I'm continuing writing and producing and directing and consulting on entertainment stuff. Uh, and then this will get us into the Q&A, I think, which uh, I'll let you obviously be the host. But um, for the future, my friend Mike Shaw and I will have an announcement, and he'll pop up at the Q&A to talk more about it. But we are officially launching a new platform called Migration Media. That's to aggregate the best international podcasts, blogs, vlogs, et cetera, from around the world. It's not specifically, we both happen to be in this room, but it's not China focused. But we'll talk more about that at Q&A time. Great. Well, it is Q&A time. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you want to start, because I think that's probably a good lead-in to sort of 
um, give a quick plug, but I think it's really great what you guys are aiming to do with migration media. So, you know, if you want to share that with the audience, I think that would be great. Thank, thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Um, how many people here are expats? How many expats? That's uh, well over half, probably. So there are 257 million more of you. So we are a huge population. Uh, if we were a country, we'd be the fifth largest country in the world by population. Uh, we're growing at the fastest rate of any population on Earth. We've grown at 46% since the year 2000. Nigeria, number two, has grown at 38%. They'll have a billion people by the end of the century. So we don't have a BBC. We don't have uh, a, a news network. I, don't presume we're going to be a news network, but we don't have a forum for sharing our stories, for talking about ourselves. I want to call out one thing on a point at the introvert, John. One thing he said earlier was, I'm here, I'm married, I have my family, I have my children. And then he said, this is where, he paused and he says, I am. I want, an, I, I want him on my show now because I want to dig into that. Like That's what my show is about. It's called Migratory Patterns. And I'm trying to kind of dig into what our concepts of home are is. So my podcast is two questions. Where is home and what is home? Because we live overseas, we have this very unique idea of what home means. And, and we don't talk about it with each other. We don't have a forum where we've discussed this. People who don't move overseas have never heard of this before. It's very foreign to them. And this is a time in, in human history where there's never been more people, either by numbers or percentage of the population, who have been going through this experience. So we're changing as a social species. And we are going to create migration media as a platform where creators from within our cohort, people living overseas, can come together, tell our stories through whatever medium they want, and basically become the place where we can discuss these things and where people who aren't living this experience can look in and kind of see what's going on. So it's about time we started actually sharing these stories with each other, creating our own culture, and you know, becoming a part of the world in a much more vocal way. That's what we're aiming to do. So um, we actually both have a little short episode detailing all this with all the links to our socials and such. Uh, 8 a.m. tomorrow, that'll go live on my show, and Mike can, uh, you can check out his show if you're curious. Or just talk to us, because you know, we're here. Awesome. Uh, well, I guess maybe we can take a few questions from the audience now, and let's say, let's take maybe three questions if people have them, and then we can sort of figure out whoever wants to answer which question can choose your question. So. Well, if there's just three questions, I'm jump jumping. Um, hi, uh, my name is Aladdin. I also do a podcast anyway uh, to come back to the because one of my friend does a podcast just for French entrepreneur I'm French as well for French people in Shanghai so that's like even more niche <laughs> I think um, but but then he told me that really worked well because he told me there was a lot of podcasts about entrepreneur in China and then he was like I give up I just focus on the French speaking world and apparently that went well and that also went well because I think we didn't talk at all about the distribution thing which is spending money on Facebook and Twitter so some of you you run your own company so I guess the podcast is more some kind of advertisement marketing tool but for women and big fish in the middle kingdom maybe that's just like hobby, no, I put really big quote on that, and that's part of your life, as you said, but then did you think about putting money into this, uh, just to have more clicks, because at the end of the day, do you do this just for the beauty of it, or maybe for more, getting more money? Something might have gotten lost in translation. Mine is an extension of my brand, I mean, because I'm a consultant about this, and so on my show, I mean, people who listen learn my particular take on specifically entertainment. So. Um, I could be more on the nose about it as a branding uh, tool, but it, but it is. I'm not offended. I'm just trying to be clear that it's that's that's a side effect. That wasn't the primary focus. I have spent money on Facebook ads. That's how I have 22,000 members on my page, of which about 200 care. <laughs> so I would save your money. Yeah, I mean, so so for marketing purposes, no. Um, I think, again, so one of the reasons that I wanted to work with Matt specifically was that he was already well known in the community, um, and, and he's kind of a, a marketer by trade, um, and so we've, our, our downloads are pretty good. Uh, they're fairly stable, I would say, but, um, but they're not. Um, so we get, we get about 3,000 downloads per, per episode. 
Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how that, how that compares to anyone. Certainly, we could do better, I'm sure, if we actually put the work into marketing it more. But, um, but we're getting what, what we want out of it. Um, 3,000 ep downloads per episode, I think, is pretty, pretty good. Um, it's kind of, kind of going up into the right, but, but very slowly. Um, and, and so, in terms of spending money on marketing, I mean, like, again, I don't. I have I have an I have an allergy to marketing somehow. Um, so if 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 Matt and I were to talk about it, if he were to push it and he would say, hey, let's put some money into this, but he's gonna do it, I'll be like, okay, fine. Um, and then we'll see see how it goes. But it's never never something that's come up, um, and it's not something that I, I really think about. Um, so and, and and at the end of the day, I mean, like podcasting, it's it's a, it's a passion project. So on the one hand, if we weren't getting good feedback from listeners, um, if we weren't getting the, the download numbers that we are, I probably would be a bit discouraged um, in thinking about ways to, uh, to do that, but um, I don't, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for us, it is a hobby um, because we have a very, very easy job. And but particularly for me, uh, I was a reporter, and I feel like you know I can go down to a field today. I can talk to a peasant tomorrow. I can t talk to a minister. So that's something I feel like that's my connection to China. But after I moved to the business side, that everyone I communicate work in the business. Um, so I talk to PR head, I talk to sometimes CEO, CFO, but you know, that's not China, that's Beijing, Shanghai, that's tech world, right? So um, I feel like I use this opportunity to connect to China to a certain way. Um, in terms of money, you know, we, we never spend money on marketing. We put our, a lot of our own money into renting studio, buying equipment, that kind of thing. Uh, we thought about you know, how to, what's our business model? Should we have a business model? Should we think about earning money? But at this stage, we decide not to because we like freedom of speech to a certain extent. And I mean, coming from China, there's a lot of limitation, particularly if you have programming in Chinese, there's only so little you can say. Um, and if you have an investor, you know, we will know that, you know, investor or platform tell you whatever you can say, whatever you, you cannot say. Actually, the other day, we are having a discussion about, you know, future of media. We say, you know, we are, our type of a media is the, the future of a media. You know, you have a stable job, you use that, jobs, income to support your hobby. So then you can do whatever content you want to do. Um, and it may not work for everyone, but you know, for now, that's how we run our podcast. Yeah. I would just say, if, if you're a new podcaster and you have a little bit of money to spend, definitely spend it on making your show good, having the right equipment. Um, de the marketing is something you do only if you had a really great product. Um, already I think um, I think for new podcasters the easiest way to, to have an, an audience from the beginning is um, if you have a built-in community or platform so we you know we launched through the Beijing Energy Network which already had a email list there with a couple thousand people um, or if you're targeting you know specific language groups and French expats in Shanghai um, I think that would work as well Thank you very much. Um, I came late, so if you've answered this, please let me know. But I'm wondering whether what officialdom has to say about podcasting. Have any of you looked at regulations? Have any of you had any interference, any contact, any questions, and uh, any advice if for people doing podcasting here? Well, I mean, so you mean local authorities, right? Like no, local, Chinese, local, local regulations. Chinese, yeah, Chinese. Uh, at any level. Yeah. Better. So, so uh, we're we're in English and we're really small. So I don't think anyone really cares. Is yeah. basically what it comes down to. Um, so again, I worked at state media for six years, and um, working uh, mostly on the domestic side. And the great thing is that um, so we we had two sides. And the international the international side had a lot more pressure about being politically correct because you know. Ambassadors, China, ambassadors to various countries would be listening to it uh, while they were abroad. Whereas for us, I mean, like we we were just broadcasting in Beijing and Shanghai and maybe a few other places, all in English. So I mean, you know, local authorities on the one hand, they probably can't understand what we're saying. Um, on the on the other hand, our actual impact is going to be fairly low. Like we're not going to be starting any social movements, you know. Um, 
So in terms of regulation, in terms of interference, there's, there's basically been nothing. We're just not important enough. I haven't had any interference. It's a question that I've weighed. Uh, like this new venture is not, a, this is a, this is our US company, for instance, the thing that Mike and I are doing. Um, but great question. I mean, my point of view, just in a quick nutshell, you know, I'm here to do my little small part to help, not to be too much of a hippie about it, but I, I'm here because I want to be here. You know, I didn't have to come here. It, it cost me money and left things behind to come here and be here. I want to be here and I want to try to help. So basically, if anyone was listening and monitoring every word of my show, they would have nothing, they would have no problems with it. And I'm not being a shill. I just generally, I, I respect the effort that's been made here. And I respect the people who I know, both locals and foreigners, who are trying to make this little piece of the world a better place. I do sound like a hippie, God, sorry. But I'm sincere in saying that, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm here for good and not evil. So if anybody's checking me out, I don't think they have any problems. Well, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think also one of the big things is not so much about regulation, but, I mean, you know, we're publishing this, and it's going to exist basically forever. Um, so you do, I, I think that there are, there have been cases where, you know, I have pulled some punches still. Um, there are cases where I will, be, I will, maybe will dance around certain topics, um, but that's, that's not because anything has happened, just because I don't want to have to worry about that. Um, can, can I answer that too? Yeah, for sure. I mean, being um, the Chinese employee for foreign media, uh, for four years, so I understand, how, you know, what government can do to you. So that's exactly the reason, like I mentioned, why I chose, why Jingjing and I, we, we chose to do the po uh, podcast in Chinese. Because that, <laughs> shit. <laughs> that's why you chose to do Take two, take two. Yeah, take two, three. Yeah, that's why we, we chose that to do that in English, because that can really lift up a lot of limitation, restriction, you know, topic. Um, for example, like, you know, one of my colleagues, actually she does one of her own podcast. Um, recently her episode was about sexual harassment. Actually, it's, she only talked about like for five minutes and she tried to upload it to Simalaya and they didn't let it go, they didn't approve it. Yeah, exactly, automatically, they limit what you can say. So she has to cut that part and put the rest of the show on the platform. Then it got approval. So yeah, we don't want that kind of limitation. We don't want to self-censor. We want to have a real conversation, can talk about whatever we want to talk about. Of course, there's a certain limit. We don't want to, you know, talking about our separate garment or something. But we want to have a you know genuine voice from us and our guests. So that's why, you know, we chose the language as what it is, yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, as much as we talk about the importance of identifying to define your niche, uh, your audience, or your the niche you're trying to get into, how do you avoid just feeding certain information to certain audience? Uh, for instance, for like, especially for environment and gender issues, as my understanding. So people who care about environment and gender issue will listen to this podcast, while those who doesn't uh, will not. So how would you, ha, ha, what would you do to like kind of include more marginal population, marginal audience to your podcast? And if you want to make an impact, like yeah, with this can podcast. I, can I answer this first? Actually for us, we want to make it as inclusive as possible. We, we keep telling people that we are not only about women issue. We want to talk about China. We want to include, you know, com uh, information about how Chinese people travel, you know, how Chinese collectors collect interesting antiques. Um, women issue is only a part of what we talk about. If we only limit on that topic, that's like exactly like what you talk about. You know, that that's going to limit a lot of people, a lot of audience. Um, I know there are a bunch of um, podcasts right now focusing at, on that topic. They are doing great work, but what? But at least as far as I know, they have already an audience base, so people would follow them. So that would be much easier for them to build build up their listeners. But for us, we come from, from scratch. We don't have any audience base. So we try to be as inclusive as possible. You know, we can, we talk about China, we can talk about anything about China, right? So yeah, that's how we approach it. Sorry. 
That's fine. That's fine. Um, so I think I think that that you have to be really careful about. I mean, about going after a marginal marginal listeners. Um, is is it really worth your time? And and to what degree are you compromising your original vision? Um, I think that you have to be very clear about who you're trying to target. Uh, very clear about that. Um, and then that's how you design your show. Um, trying to do too much, trying to be too broad, uh, at the end you're not going to be serving anyone, unfortunately, because you're trying to serve everyone. Um, also, you know, we're, we're, in the, we're in the age of personalized content. And so you're asking about how to, how to, how to, how to be, be a bit more broad, and I say don't be broad. Honestly, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's a good idea. I think you, you need to say, this is what I'm really good at. This is what I can talk about. These are the people that I can talk with. And if, if I know enough people who are interested in this, then probably there's a big enough audience for it as well. Um, and, and yeah, of course, you can always grow your podcast in, di in different ways, but at the end of the day, you know, people are going to listen to you because they want to listen to you. And, and as you were saying, if they don't want to listen to you, they're not going to. And there's not much you can do to convince them otherwise. Um, so people, you know, you, you, look at, you look at how we consume content, content these days, um, and we continually get stuff that's related to what we've already consumed. Um, and so how do you, I mean, you know, looking looking at uh, iTunes iTunes algorithms, for example. I mean, how do you how do you get outside of that? Um, and I think trying trying to fight this this trend or this system in some cases might be might be futile. Yeah, I would just a second that the the whole world is not going to listen to your podcast. Um, that being said, you know, and and specifically, you know, we are what some people might consider a very niche podcast. Um, if if you're not living in China um, and you don't care about the environment, then you, probably, you might not listen to our podcast. That being said, um, you'd be surprised once you put something out on the internet, what, you know, the, the audience that does grow around that. So we'll get random emails from people in um, South Africa, in, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, South America, who we didn't, we didn't know cared about environmental issues in China. But um, I think, yeah, you find, find what you're good at and, and do that would be my advice. Well, on that note, the time is unfortunately up. Um, so I think we'll end there, but just wanted to again, thank our panelists so much for participating tonight. Like I mentioned earlier, this is something we've been wanting to do for a very long time. Um, so we're glad to see not only all of our panelists participate, but also um, so many other podcast enthusiasts or amateur or professional podcasters in the room here. Um, and also just a huge thank you again to um, the other members of the Environment China team who helped out with tonight's event. We have Alec on sound and we'll see how this turns out in the end. Um, <laughs> a couple of, <laughs> not our microphones, just kidding. Well, actually. Uh, <laughs> Some of them, uh, not all, uh, but also um, some of the other members of the team who contributed with the venue, the PowerPoint, and other factors, so really appreciate it. And um, thank you all for coming and listening, and I think we have a few minutes that we can linger, um, maybe until like 15, 15, 20 minutes or so, and then um, may have to head out after that, but thank you again. Oh, one more thing. I'll end with uh, our, our tagline on Environment China is, see you next time, smog or shine. So I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs>